episode. <laughs> Big killer. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's all right. We're learning how to edit. <laughs> and I'm trying. Okay, I can't get the go. Okay, I have this box in the middle. Okay, got it. it, it oh, whatever. Okay, we can't, um, we can't see it. Okay, as long as I can read my correction. Uh -huh. You can I, move it up to the top or down to the bottom. No, my mouse isn't even, whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay, my name is Sue Olson. I'm from Washington County, Pennsylvania. Um, I began beekeeping in 1990. Oh yeah, I can't, this is gonna drive me crazy. I'm sorry. No, I understand. Okay, let me do this one second. Screen. Oh, I guess while she's checking things out, I ask everybody to uh, mute their microphones so she doesn't get any feedback from you all. If you don't, I will. You know what? It won't let me prog progress anywhere. I can't get rid of this box. Oh, wait. Now it's working. Okay, now let's see. Whatever. I'm just going to move on. It's all good. Okay. My name's Sue Olson. Excuse the nose. I got one of my grandkids' colds again. I began beekeeping in 1993. Um, I live about a little about an hour north of Morgantown, and I taught school in Pittsburgh for 21 years, which is an hour north of me. And um, I was able to take through Bird Bees a introductory beekeeping class um, at the Penn State Extension down in East Liberty, and it was taught by Joe Zagurski and Steve Rapaski, who are both EAS Master Beekeepers. It was a uh, three week long class, three hours each course. It was a nine hour course, great course, learned a ton, but it was in January. So it was all, um, you know, book work. We did not touch bees. We didn't dissect a hive. So then in the spring, I got my packages of bees because I started with packages, which every each their own. And I got through till like April and my two hives were dead. And I was like, this sucks. So I tried it again the next year, spent money on bees. You know, I saw three kids at home and the next April, mm, dead. They would get through most way through the winter. I took a couple of years off because I figured I was too busy and tried it a third time, dead. I'm like, okay, this is a joke. Everywhere I started going to meetings and I introduced myself as a bee killer and not a bee keeper. So then I joined the Morgantown, the Mon County Bee Group. And there were a number of women who were extremely kind to me. Deb Maine, Linda Casey, they greeted me. I knew nobody. I just walked in and I have such a shy personality. I was terrified. No, I walked into these meetings, knew nobody. And they greeted me. They made me feel welcome and just super nice ladies. And then, so I attended a couple of their meetings and then I had joined some Facebook groups and I like to hike and I like to go by myself to hike. And I happened to see this weirdly named group called the Highland Apicultural Society, like this big fancy name. And they're down outside of Elkins, West Virginia. So I, I randomly messaged this woman and said, hey, I'm from Pennsylvania. Do you mind if I come to this lecture? Who now, I, it was given by Shanda King on um, pollen and nectar flow sources. And this woman said, well, absolutely come on down. And then I get a text that weekend and she says, Hey, we're having dinner at the Mexican at the five way. You're more than welcome to join us. So I didn't want to look like an idiot. So I pulled up a map of Elkins and there's only one place that five roads come together. <laughs> and I found these people and I was introduced to this group, about 12 people sitting there, went to this lecture and thus began my journey into becoming a beekeeper. Um, Phyllis started the Women's West Virginia group. I joined that group. Deb Maine was part of that group. So these two ladies made me feel very comfortable, welcome me, even though I was a Pennsylvania person. And I started going to these meetings and now I've gotten four years of surviving hives. So how did I become a beekeeper instead of a killer? I joined the Mon County Bee Group first, went to this random meeting. I joined the West Virginia Women Beekeepers. From them, I found this group, the Mountaineer Beekeepers, which is over two hours from my home. They have virtual meetings. I do some, um, but they have field days where you get to go do things. And again, 
this has increased this, this network of wonderful people that have helped. I've done B chats on Tuesday with Phyllis. I've done study groups with Deb on Thursdays. Do I make them all the time? Absolutely not. Do they judge me? Absolutely not. But I get tons of information. I've got to attend regional and state conferences in Pennsylvania and West Virginia. I got to go to Hive Life this year in Sevierville, Tennessee, where there was like 25 plus West Virginia people there, people I met from Pennsylvania. The best gift I've gotten from beekeeping, besides my good stuff for my bees, is the wonderful friendships and camaraderie I've gained. Um, so I was never successful with my bees. I never worked bees with another human being until I went to my first retreat um, for women's beekeepers, West Virginia, um, down at Phyllis's place. And it has made my learning curve skyrocket. Okay, so I'm supposed to talk about basic honeybee biology. Um, good old Apis mellifera, better known as Western honeybees. So good old insect, took a picture. They're a true insect. They got three parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Cool thing is they have five eyes. They have three little teeny simple eyes that do nothing but react to light intensity. And then they got these two giant compound eyes that are made up of thousands of these little teeny cells that perceive color, light, and directional information from the sun's rays. They got their tongue and jaws. They got their tongue, their proboscis. They use it to lap and suck up fluids, water, nectar, honey. They've got these big old jaws, mandibles that are used for chewing pollen and shaping their beeswax. You think antenna aren't that big of a deal? They are like one of the coolest things on a bee. If you cut off a bee's antenna, and put it back into the hive, it will die. The reason being the antenna is made up of all these little teeny segments that contain most of the touch and smell receptors of that bee. Um, these specialized organs here, they guide the bees both inside and outside of the hive. You know, outside they got daylight, inside that hive, they like it dark. These antenna also allow them to differentiate between hive, floral and pheromone odors. Then you got that big bulky thorax and it contains the muscles that controls the two pair of wings and those three pair of legs. Um, I really didn't talk about it with their legs. They have pollen baskets. It's a special portion of the leg, but I'm not gonna worry about that. Now, interesting, bees don't breathe in and out like we do. They've got these pairs of holes down there, size on their thorax called spiracles. And when you get better with your bees, there's a lot of you that already all do this, but you know, there's some people that like to roll their bees in powdered sugar because they don't want to kill them and people that do alcohol washes. And, you know, the one thing I've learned as a beekeeper, you ask three different people the same question and you're going to get four answers and three are right and one is wrong or they're all the same or different. I'm not a big fan of powdered sugar rolls because you kill them with the alcohol, but that powdered sugar, you're plugging up all those little spiracles, which always kind of makes me crazy um, when you're testing bees, but that's either here or there. Then you got this abdomen, longest part of the bee. It's armor plated, um, it's scaled, it's got segments, it protects the bee, and it also helps the bee's body from drying out. And that stinger is located down at the end of the abdomen. Um, they're wax secreting glands. And then there's also a scent gland. Now the abdomen is a bit different between workers, drones, and queens. The worker bees have the glands that can secrete wax and then these scent glands. And one thing I'm trying to work on as a beekeeper is getting more drawn comb. And I finally, through my thick skull and listening to the same talks over and over, understand for my bees to draw wax, my worker bees, they need to be in a good flow. And I need to have a good number of bees. The queen has ovaries. She's got a storage sack for drone semen, um, many different glands. She produces pheromones and a sting, um, but she has no wax glands. The drone abdomen contains male reproductive organs no wax glands and no sting. Of course, there's always a rare exception. Sometimes once in a blue moon, you can get a drone that has both male and female parts and it makes them a gonandromorph. 
and those little suckers can sting. But that, again, one of the lessons I didn't learn until I've been keeping bees for like flipping six years is I didn't know drones couldn't sting. So they're a great way when you're teaching kids to let them handle a bee or somebody that's scared of them. It's a great way if you're trying to learn to mark queens and you don't want to murder your queen, you could practice on drones because they're easy to pick up and they're not going to hurt you. Like they're, they're bags of semen. All right. Importantly, inside of that bee, you have the honey stomach or sac or crop, what you want to refer it to. Sometimes people say, you know, bees vomit their honey. Well, that's kind of a gross description because truly the bees, your esophagus, your food tube um, that you swallow your food in as humans, for the bees, it starts at the back of their mouth. It continues to their thorax and it terminates at the beginning of the abdomen where it expands and it forms that honey stomach and that that crop or sack or stomach that it's all folded so that worker she could fill it very you know she could really fill it up the stomach is past that so what's interesting about that stomach so go back to the honey crop the nectar the honeydew the water that all gets stored in there and brought back in that bee stomach on the other side of that honey crop in their stomach, they carry a beneficial bacteria called lactobacillus. And when that bee is transferring the nectar and pollen into the hive um, from its honey stomach, some of that lactobacillus from its true stomach is being mixed in to what they have brought into the hive. It's really important because it helps in the formation of the honey and the bee bread. And it also provides bees, most research shows, against some protection against certain pathogens. Okay, inside the colony. <laughs> I don't even know what it says. It says the honeybee colony, blah. I don't even remember what it says because my I have this recording box over it. But anyway, oh, I know what. The honeybee colony, um, it's what you call youth social. It is a complete organism within itself. So it's a group of organisms acting together, characterized by cooperative care of young and overlapping generations. So inside the colony, the bees makes their nest of parallel combs with the hexagonal shaped cells. That hexagon shape, if you looked and had a engineer come in and design that, that shape provides the strongest cell possible. And somehow in the evolution of the honeybees, they have figured this out. That is what makes that hexagon shape work so well. Um, the comb is made up of beeswax that the bees make from their own body. And that wax is used for two things. It's used for a pantry. They store food, they store nectar, pollen, bee bread. It's also a cradle for their young bees, their brood, because that's where the queen lays her eggs. Um, the central comb, a good central comb, many times will have a really pretty pattern to it. Like if you have the picture perfect comb, which <clears throat> they're not all like that. So in the middle of the comb, you're going to see open brood. You could see some sealed brood. Then you'll see another band of pollen. And then on the outside, another band of honey. And the honey's cool because all my reading it does, it provides an excellent insulator for them both to cool and heat um, those young ones. So bees, it's a caste system, it's a division of labor. We've got drones that are my males, we've got the sterile females, which are my workers, and we got the fertile females, which are the queens. These three types, they cannot change much and each will not survive without the contribution of the rest of them. Bees are a true insect because they go through complete metamorphosis. They go through the four complete stages. They have the queen lays eggs. Um, when they're hatched, the worker bees come in and feed them with royal jelly. And they, when they are eggs, they are pushing, 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 pushing food on them the first couple of days. Once they turn into a larva, they look like a small worm. Um, they're not fed as continuously. They're fed as needed until that larva fills that um, cell and then the worker bees come in and cap that cell with wax. We get a pupa, which you don't get to see because the, the cell is capped, but that is where we go from a worm looking thing to like 
what a bee is supposed to look like. You'll finally reach the adult. She's fully formed. He's fully formed. And then they'll chew their way out of the cell. And then I just put up a couple. Um, the chart on, picture on the left gives you their lifespan. It gives you how many days their egg, larva, and pupa. And it's different for queens, workers, and droves. And as an earlier beekeeper, I did not pay much attention to this because I just knew, I just wanted to know if my queen was in there and if she was laying eggs. But as you get further along in this game, it helps you to understand if you're getting into doing splits or, or grafting queens, these number of days are very important um, when you're keeping an eye on your hive. Upper right picture is just a little graphic, you know, egg, larva, pupa, adult. And then the bottom again, um, you know, your, your bees, your worker, your queen, and your drone. The drones have those big ginormous eyes that look like they're meeting in their head. And they remind me of like a big old Dusseldorf climbing around on the top of the hive. Okay, my queen, she is the reproductive center of the colony. Only female that can lay fertilized eggs. If your queen goes missing, you can have a worker bee. And I talk a little bit more a bit about it, but you can have a female bee begin to lay eggs, but they are not fertilized. So she could only produce males, which isn't gonna do any good for your colony. Your queen, God willing, could be the longest living individual in the colony. She's the largest in the size with the longest, slim, you know, nice abdomen coming out. About a week after she hatches, she's gonna go out on a mating flight and possibly mate with 17 to 20 drones. Once that queen comes back and starts laying eggs, she's not gonna leave that colony again unless she leaves with the swarm to establish another nest. Your worker bees are fully formed females who ovaries stay small and underdeveloped due to the presence of that queen's pheromone. So that queen is moving all throughout that hive, releasing that queen's pheromone. And that keeps those females' ovaries under, underdeveloped. But if that queen goes MIA for some reason, then you will have not one laying worker, you typically will have multiple laying workers. And there are these little worker bees who are not getting that pheromone. And for some reason, their little ovaries perk up and they lay on fertilized eggs because they never left the hive to be fertilized. They don't have that ability. So you just get drones laid. Um, responsibilities of worker bees, honey production, pollen collection, temperature regulation, rearing brood, wax and royal jelly, and defense. They are the smallest individuals in the colony and they got the shortest lifespan. Now they are cool because they have specialized structures. They have a functional barbed sting, modified legs for pollen collection, and a scent gland. That's why when a honeybee stings you, it's got a hook on the end. So it rips out that poison sac and then that bee is gonna die. Sometimes immediately, a couple hours, sometimes even up to a couple days versus yellow jackets who have the ability to sting you over and over and over again. Um, worker bees, from the time they hatch out, they're gonna progress through different stages, being house bees, doing duties within the hives. And the last bit of their life, they finally get to go outside to be foragers and then they just wear out and die. Then we have with worker bees also, the queen starting, I may, you know, feel free to correct me. Um, September, I think she might start laying her winter bees. Winter bees are different than my summer worker bees. My summer worker bees are only good for, you know, 20 some days. Your winter bees, which are also worker bees, they have to last three, four months. They have to last the entire winter. And those winter bees have these weird things called fat bodies that give them the ability to store energy and to be able to last longer through that weather. Um, one of the reasons you end up losing hives, besides the number one varroa mite control, um, is that if you get a hive that is honey bound towards August into September, that queen sometimes will run out of room to lay eggs. So you need to check to make sure your brood boxes are not too full because if you become honey bound and she cannot lay enough eggs, you're going to end up with a very small cluster um, going over the winter and those bees will not have the ability to move um, to their food source. Drone beads, <laughs> he's a haploid, 
It's a virgin birth. He only has a cro half the chromosomes. He has no father. He dies in the mating process, but he gets to do this really cool thing. Your drones will not mate with the queen that is within their hive. Scientists are still trying to figure out how it works, but there's these areas called drone congregating areas and drones will leave hives and fly well over two miles and numbers of drones from different hives. And they have these areas that stay the same from year to year to year, the structure does not change. Your queen will fly sometimes with some attendance to these drone congregating areas and she will mate with 17 to 20 um, drones and she will get a good solid mating. If you have a virgin go out in the spring and it's rainy and she only gets partially mated, she's not gonna be a great layer. So now I have this long quote and I'm not gonna see the last two lines, but it's, um, I think it's important. It says the most important aspect of understanding the activities and behavior of bees, whether it be an individual or the entire colony is to recognize that every bee action is attributable to some kind of situation or stimulus. And to put it in the English, says the more a beekeeper, I can't see it, understands why a bee does what it does, the better a beekeeper she is going to be. And I have really, really learned that the last couple of years, listening to these chats, um, listening to, if you go to a lecture at a conference and then you go to another conference and the same lecture is being given, there's nothing wrong with hearing it. I've heard the same lectures by the same people three, four, five times. And every time I get a little bit more experience under my belt, I get something else out of that lecture that my brain finally says, well, that makes sense. That's why they're doing this. All right, how do bees communicate? They communicate with sight. They do all these crazy dances, waddle dances, all these cool things to communicate, locations of food sources, all the way down to they can do a dance within the hive to get somebody to come over and give them a good grooming session. There is sound. I read it was really interesting that the honeycomb in a beehive acts as almost like a sounding board, which can help amplify the sounds that are being made within that hive. So they communicate via sound. Um, the first time I heard this little beep, beep, and I have no clue what it was till I asked. And it was where one of my hives, um, <laughs> I guess it had swarmed, but there was another queen that had hatched and there were queens calling out to each other because one of them is going to die. Um, if you have a beehive you go to get into and it's queenless and you take that lid off that hive, they can make a roar that does not sound like rest of your hive. So sound is a huge communication tool. They taste. Um, food sharing is a primary honeybee activity. It is thought to transmit nutrients and information back and forth between adults, as well as across different developmental stages. Scent was supposed to be big. Scent is a huge way on how bees communicate. So they have these whole class of chemicals called pheromones, and they're different ones identified in queens, workers, and drones. I talked about the queen substance the queen gives off, which keeps the worker bees' ovaries in check. They're shriveled and non-productive. The worker bur worker burrs, the worker bees secrete pheromones from their nasogoth glands that recruit bees from outside of the colony to inside, letting them know, hey, this is home. The uh, sting apparatus releases an alarm pheromone. So if you get stung by a bee and that poison sac pulls out, there is a pheromone that is released in that process that lets the other bees know, hey, somebody just stung somebody, you're alerted, come help. There's literally a recent study shows there's something called a footprint pheromone that allows bees to track where others have walked within the hive. Um, so with my smoker, using cool smoke is really good because it masks the alarm pheromone. So if somebody's upset with me and I've used that smoke, it's going to reduce how many bees come to the defense. So when you smoke your bees, they're going to um, move away from that smoke source. They usually will engorge themselves with honey. And when they engorge that honey stomach, it makes them less likely to sting, but they still can. Um, that I just briefly touch, you temperature regulate, they do it for warmth. 
Um, the bees will typically in the hive below 57 degrees form a cluster. You still could get bees flying on 40 degrees days, but they form that cluster and the cluster, it's, it's fascinating because they don't vibrate their wings, they vibrate their bodies and they literally contract and expand depending on the temperature because they want to keep that temperature within that cluster, I guess it's like right around 90 degrees or so. Um, so you have to have, it's a perfect world to have the correct size cluster for that group to make it through the winter. If your cluster is too small, they're not going to be able to move through to their food source and you can end up with starving bees and honey just a couple inches away. If your cluster is way too large, you risk them going through all their honey stores way before winter is over and you're going to have to supplemental feed. Bees also cool by collecting water and fanning air currents through the colony. Many new beekeepers panic, which that's me, when they see this extreme bearding in hot weather. Um, I'll have a picture of the next one. I went out last summer and all of my hives, I like, oh goodness, they're gonna swarm, but they were just on the front porch on a hot day. And then swarming is the process where one colony becomes two. And I know somebody's doing a whole talk on that. So this is a picture of my hive that year that, um, last summer when they were, they were bearding and they were all back in the next day. I went down there and had a drink and sat and watched them for a while and it was all good. So that's what I have. Any questions? Thank you very much. That was awesome. What the, yes. And I will post on the lady site, my credits where I got this information because I plagiarized. <laughs> Right. And she but I've, got she... two, I've got two books and one is the book that um, Deb used for the study group, that beekeeper's handbook. Uh -huh. And then I have another book that I used for my very first beekeeping class. And it's very nice and straightforward on what it does. Very cool. All right. But oh, oh, I did get out of here. Does anybody have any questions for Sue about the bees? The talk that she just gave? Did everybody go to sleep? No, no ma'am. No, it was very good. Thank you. No. No. Um, but my biggest thing I got out of this that I wanted to say that I, you know, three <laughs> things that I wish somebody would have told me when I started keeping bees. Um, number one, drones don't sting. I looked that I, I learned that at Phyllis's. I felt like a dumbass. Um, <laughs> number two, I got packages the first couple of years. Now I get nukes, but you know, it's the progression of the game. But the first time I emptied a package out by myself with no clue of what was going on, I know the queen came in a little box and she's got a little sugar plug and you have to suspend her and let her sit for three days so they get used to her. But nobody told me there were attendant bees in the little box with her. And I was like freaking out because there were like multiple bees. So I thought something had gotten in there. So that was another one of those things. And the other one is ask a question. You're gonna get a million answers. And everybody's answer could be different. Are you a backyard hobby beekeeper? Are you a sideliner? You know, a hundred some hives. Are you a commercial beekeeper? Is your purpose to make honey? Is your purpose to make wax? All of those different things can make the same question have three different answers. And mm -hmm. you just learn and listen to people talk. And if you don't agree with what they say, lots of times, you know, from just my limited knowledge, I just shake my head and I walk away and then I, I pick out of that conversation um, what's going to work for me. But those are the three things. And the other thing is having people to work with. I never worked hives with another human being until that retreat. And Phyllis was nothing more than gracious on, you know, you know, watching us pick up her precious piece. <laughs> I would say my bees were gracious. <laughs> but, I, was, okay. I was going like this. <laughs> now you guys don't bother me, but the first year I had you there, it was it was pretty hectic. <laughs> now I'm like, eh, they're they're fun. Lift that up. <laughs> all right, that's all I got. <laughs> well done, Susan. Yes, very well done. Um, the only thing this uh, when Sue was talking about smoking, like when they everybody says they smell like bananas so when you smell smell bananas 
then you need to, to use your smoker. And there's a proper way and an improper way to do that. Um, I, I, was, I was given a, a video last year of a woman getting in her hive and, and long story short, she took the smoker and she, and she blew it in the front. And I, I don't agree with that at all, but Bob Benny does it and he's a guru, but I still don't agree with it because when you blow in the front, they say you're telling them you're there. It's like, well, they probably would never know I'm there because I'm dealing with the on top ones, right? So scratch that one off. I don't agree with that one. And then you're blowing it in. So the smoke makes the bees go in and up. Well, then you're going to open that lid and they're all going to be. Eh. But then some people, like my husband, he cracks the lid and he smokes, gives them a little bit of smoke and puts the lid back down. Me, I don't give them any smoke. I crack the lid and I open the lid away from me. And, and then after I open it and they tell me what kind of bees they're going to be, then I decide if I'm going to use the smoke or not use the smoke. So I, the, the video that I got last year, and I, I have to laugh because bless her heart, she had no idea what she was doing. And that's what we want to, you know, help you guys with. But you don't take that smoker and, you, you know, you prime it, you get it ready and it's smoking really good. And then you smoke the shit out of them. And then you go, oh, well, they're really mean today. And it was like, yeah, that's why they're mean. So yeah. learn how to to smoke your bees and do it lightly. And if they're when you open your lid and they're coming up like this, if you would take your, your smoker and blow up above and the smoke falls down. It's just an amazing calming that they do. Don't don't blow it right on their their frames, but blow it up here, and then they just the smoke comes down onto their frames, and then they just you can just hear them be quiet. So try that the next time you get into your hives, or when you guys get your hives. But smoke can be your friend, and smoke can be your enemy because you make them mad if you use too much smoke. Anybody want to add to that? I, in the spring, when things are quiet, happy, lots of times I don't use any smoke at all. But then you start rolling right. in the fall where they're evil demon spawn creatures, then I'll use a little bit more. Oh, that's the other thing. The four, number four of things I wish I had figured out earlier was how to keep a smoker lit. Now, yes, I've mastered that finally with my own little weird combination of stuff that works but it works and it makes cool smoke. And it's, I've learned to light my smoker, sit it outside my garage, then put on my bee suit and everything. And by the time I get that done and range and then pull out my RTV to drive over there, it's usually going good. I've done it too many times where I lit it and then I went to go work and it was out. You rushed it. Yep. Mm -hmm. and That's it's what happens have the, to me all the time. Yeah, you gotta have the coals it, underneath, yep. Yep. Yeah, I get it out there and I don't use it that often. And then when I go to use it, it's it's dead. You got to keep but, it primed. And if you work in bees all day, you learn how to do that. You know, it's just like, I don't know, keeping well, your also, wood stove going. A trick I learned that if it's not burning, you know, I've got my suit and everything on. So by Shobi, I, I have one of those propane tubes, you know, with the lighter on the top. Um, you can literally you know, pump your bellows and you could take that flame and just flame the outside of your smoker. It doesn't have to be inside and it creates enough heat that it will ignite again what's on the inside as you're priming it. Learn that mm -hmm. trick a couple years ago. That's pretty neat. Yeah, yeah Megan does that. That's where I learned it from Megan. I no, no, Megan does. She puts it in the back. Yeah, in the air hole. Sue right. said, she just said, doesn't matter where you put it. Right on the side, no hole. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Megan puts hers in the hole, and that's how she lights it from the bottom up. Which she said really works well. Um, Tara asked, uh, Tar Tarmara's, Tarmara, sorry, um, asked about a book. We're not using a book. We're uh, all of us beekeepers got together, and uh, we used the Penn State book last year, and it was just, I think they uh, put in a lot of extra stuff that new beekeepers do not need to, to know. And um, so we got away from that and each person 
like uh, I, you know, I did colony. Uh, I don't even know what my talk was about, but it was about what is in a hive and then the organization. And then Sue did biology and, and Rhonda and I have the list. Um, yeah, that was Rhonda. And I have the list on the, the women's page. Um, so that's that's what you'll know what we're doing. And, and if you want to, to look ahead, you know, um, any reading or whatever, and then drill us <laughs> when we give a talk, uh, you know, feel You know feel what free. that's good, Tamara? I can, I'll post on the women's site tomorrow because I'm not babysitting. Um, I have like a list of six books that are really good introductory that I still like, I was going through these tonight, just reading and reading and reading. Cause the one nice thing about presenting this, it really makes you force yes. yourself to read and do, mm -hmm. which means right. it's, it's good, but I could put a list up and then That'd be other people could say, Oh, but this is a really good book because I'm, I'm a, I was a biology major. I was a forestry major. I'm a book geek. So I've got a whole library, but I will put like a couple of the really good recommended readings that I got off, you know, my first couple of classes that are really, 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 you know, just break it down plain and simple um, without going into too much craziness. I think the book we used last year is a big help is a good book too. I think that's for all levels of beekeeping. Was that that beekeeper's handbook? Yeah. 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 I do. Show it again, Kathy. I will. It's a pretty There's nice a one. If you're going to buy anything, I don't know what Sue's going to show you, but but that, okay. that one is a nice one. Same one. Yeah. Um, but, and it, I got mine for like 20 something. And then when Deb taught her class last year, um, it just seemed like everybody was getting it. And what is that one? Keeping honeybees. Keeping honey bees. Yeah. Honey then it went really, up to really 40 on Amazon. So. This one, um, this is the fourth edition. They started having the fifth edition out, but I like the fourth edition better. Okay. I think you can, on Amazon, you can, and I think you can get the fourth edition cheaper. If anybody lives close to me, I can let them borrow mine. I did that last yeah. year to one of my customers because um, I'm real big on library loans instead of purchasing because it's, I, and when the girls were up at the, at the workshop uh, this year, um, I just brought all my B books and said, help yourself. But uh, and they they went through them because I, I don't read them anymore. And um, nor did I read a lot of them. Um, what's it? O'Connor. Uh, Debbie, what's what's that? Con Andy. Andrew. Andrew. What's his last name? Connor. Connor. Does he do uh, like the how to do the queens and the swarms? Just the little books. Is that not him? Anyway, no. that he's my favorite guy. Um, so if you get into it, uh, it's I can't remember. It starts with this D. Yeah, there it is. Who is that? What I can't see the author. Which one is it? You're you're muted, babe. Sue, so you're muted. Sue. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so what, who was the author? <laughs> Lord help me. Lawrence John Connor. Connor. Yeah. And I I have all his books and absolutely love his explanation. And um, and he does, you know, swarming and uh, uh, queen rearing and all that stuff. So be essentials they're very good books and they're not expensive like these bigger books are so today i ordered there's a gal that i follow that Sh charlotte anderson mm -hmm. and she put a book out buzz into beekeeping a step-by-step -step guide to becoming a su su successful beekeeper and she released her book and it was on amazon for 18 dollars. and i ordered it today so it'll give me a couple days to get it i'll read it and i'll make a report on it before yeah. I recommend anybody buying it. Yeah, absolutely. Good to deal. Good 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 deal. Good to know is what I tried to say. <laughs> uh, good to deal. So yeah. Well that's good. Very good. I have, I have a question. Absolutely. Go ahead. 
Is there a good resource online that has all the local clubs? Um, I've been having trouble locating a local one because I would like to find somebody that I could do yeah. it. WBBA, it's, uh, it's West Virginia Beekeepers, uh, WB, West Virginia Beekeepers Association. And uh, our president, if you guys don't belong there, you, you should join uh, within your club or with our, within our women's club. You can join our women's club and for $5 and pay $6 and you can join the WBBA. And we we're having a uh, our quarterly meeting February 4th that is held on Zoom. And um, you guys need to log into that and be part of our state uh, beekeeping. And that's who puts on our fall conference. So just to let you know, um, but yeah, Louisa, uh, house, house setter, house, householder, householder is um, our president and excellent. She does an excellent job and you can always um, message and she will tell you, you know, she'll help you out for sure. Yep. And me Good here question. in Pennsylvania, when I was at Hive Life, my brother was with me, who was from Virginia. And by, I don't even know what sheer coincidence, we sat with the old extension agent from Virginia from his town. How so well? He hmm. brought up a couple clubs that he was, uh, the local club he was trying to join. And then, so we had the extension agent there. And then another couple that lived 45 minutes from him that own a bee business. They yeah. were brick and mortar store mm -hmm. and so the extension agent and the bee business um this was a good nicely run bee business with good people um mm -hmm. were able to steer him and tell him how the clubs operated differently right and what was he looking for and they gave him you know kind of a synopsis because there was like four clubs within an hour radius of him i don't think we have that here in west virginia though your extension agent would know, but no. I think your, your state group is very strong. I yes. don't have the same and it's getting better with my Pennsylvania group. Yeah, yeah. Our state group is getting better. We're doing more. Um, and just like the conference coming up, that's, that's also, it, it's run by the club, but the state uh, sponsors it and gives them money to, to help move them along and, and advice. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I'm going to put a plug in, um, talk about um, a, a bee store. But Bearsville in Pennsylvania is excellent. And I don't know if it's you not guys, Pennsylvania. It's oh, in West Virginia. I, don't, I know that. I know that. I didn't know, <laughs> you know, as soon as I didn't even know I said Pennsylvania until I took a breath. But I was looking, I was watching Sue. And, uh, but it is, it's in Parkersburg. And so, but they're just, they do all West Virginia wood and they're making their own frames um, to go into your hive and they're excellent price. And, um, but we, as our women's group, are doing a 4-H at Jackson's Mill this August, right after our retreat, uh, we're doing a, a camp and to, uh, and we're gonna have beehives there <laughs> and everything. And um, so it's through the 4-H and, but I spoke with uh, Bob today and the owner of Bearsville and he is donating all of our hardware, every piece of it, for us for five oh. frames. Plus he's given mm. us a Lanesville, a Lanestrom hive. And along with that, because we're only gonna have five there. Um, and then he's also donating a, um, a resource hive for us. So Ooh. yeah, yeah. And uh, he's all about the, the young education. Um, so we are set. And then um, through the WBBA, we'll be posting um, Christie's since this came to light, um, she's going to plug this in to the, the paper that she's writing and you'll see it all over. I'll, I'll have it posted uh, and it's for the clubs or anybody that wants to donate. But um, that's what she's going to say. We don't need to, the hardware anymore. And that's just what it's called. It's just the woodenware. And um, so, but, you know, and we're going to do a, hopefully through the WBBA, 
uh, we're going to apply for the grant and then take that money and buy suits for them. So that's what we're looking for. And then a smoker here, a hive tool there, um, you know, a brush here and, and stuff. And that's what we're asking the, the clubs to each donate something out in through the state. So if you belong to a, a, a club other than ours, then you might want to take that uh, info and because um, they'll be we'll be sending that out to them and then give them a heads up and you guys can be thinking about what you your club can donate to to these kids so cool yeah pretty excited yeah. um but um i think it's about you guys have any other questions like um you know when you when you if you're real new to this and and i know it's kind of hard you know we've only had the bees in the hub and then the biology and Rhonda what's your talk she's got the next two talks I have um starting with bees yep there you go and then I have colony management okay so these two next ones are are really good and um and I think you'll learn a lot from those and then we hope to um, in April, you know, depending on the weather, um, and maybe we can meet somewhere if, if it's cold at my house, because I do live in the mountains, and we get snow in the first of April still, and so I never know, but um, we would like to do a hands-on somewhere in somebody's out yard or, you know, backyard or whatever. If you guys, if it's too cold to my house, then maybe we can, you know, plug somebody, and if you if you just got your bees, then we can come and, and look at them, you know, like if you're in the middle, if we find that everybody's spread out, then we can pick in the middle and then just show up for the day and, and then go home. So, but that's what our last meeting will be. That'll be, in, well, we'll be done in March and then we'll, we'll do that in, in April, come together and, and uh, you know, help you see in a hive, you know, get in there. And you guys will probably get your bees because everybody gets early bees except for my customers and you won't get yours until May. So, yep. Anybody else have anything to say? You guys have any questions, like your concerns, you know, what am I doing? Or, you know, what should I buy? And because if you talk to people, um, Margaret, you're welcome. Um, but if you talk to people, don't let them tell you that you need a lot of, of things to purchase because you don't. Beekeeping, um, I learned that year because I was an inspector for the state for a little while and I got to, to work with the, the big guys. And um, they taught me so much because I was a sideliner and I probably had, uh, well, then I probably had 150 hobs. And um, so, you know, that was nothing compared to these people. And um, uh, you're welcome. Thank you for being here, uh, Lisa. And, um, but, you know, there's, they just use the bare minimum to get the job done. And that's all you need. You don't need all this fancy stuff that all these YouTubers are going to show you. Um, you know, it, it costs a lot just to feed them, you know, so um we will help you keep your costs down for sure. If you want to, if you want to be like Fred Dunn or whatever his name is, <laughs> Frederick Dunn, and uh, use any little thing that comes out, then you know, go for it. Give a give a report on it. Keep us in the know. I feel like I'm talking to a mirror. <laughs> we're just <laughs> absorbing your information <laughs> so, well, some things they bought and they never use yeah exactly well and and uh i i'm at the conference i won a uh hive toolkit and uh it had one of those frame holders on there and exactly we had I was thinking of. <laughs> yeah and uh we had two of them at home already and and it was like at the table, I said, anybody want this? And Shanda said, oh, I do. And so, cause she uses them and takes picture, you know, uses them to hold them to take pictures. Right. Yeah. So. Like mine gets in the way, it gets in the way of my cabinet because it sticks out and yeah. I never use it. 
no. <laughs> Give it to a newbie and say, here, you need this. <laughs> yeah. Frame pool. You have one more question. Sure. Frame go pool. ahead. That, you know what I do with my frame frame puller? Oh, hold on, on, Emily. What? I what put I open my frame puller and I use it to hold my hot knife. Oh yeah, that'd be cool. That'd be not, yeah, that's a good idea. All right, Emily, what's your question? Um, if for somebody who's setting up their first hive or hives, whichever way it is, right. is, is there a recommended what you put underneath them as far as, or maybe we'll talk about this in a future class and you can tell me to hold on it, but like is That's gravel okay. better? Should you put concrete under it? Is it better to leave it earth? Um, it all, it, if you're going to stay small, then you can go crazy like that. But what I do, I have mine on a stand because I have you know, 20 to 30 to sometimes 40 in a row. And so I put, just so I can see what my bees are doing and what the skunks are doing to my bees, I put um, and shingles in front of them. And which I know, you know, my husband's a contractor, so I have a whole stack of shingles, but you could use something else, just something hard that will not disintegrate. And lay that in front of them and then keep it clean and you can look at the dead bees and you can see if any skunks because they will chew them up and spit them out looks like little footballs and you know people say well you look at the front and they'll scratch them and it's like no not necessarily not if they're sitting there and and, and mine are low too so a lot of people put theirs up high and then you know i'm five five and um i don't want mine you know up too high so I want to want them low to the ground so I can maneuver them and and you know I, I need all the the angle of lift that I can get. I can't do and it above my head. When you set up your hides, it's going to be spring. Yeah, that's it. Who is this? Oh, Terry. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's a skunk. Yep. I use old um outdoor yeah. rugs. My one hive, yeah. one end of the stand is close to the ground and then it's high, but I can mow with my riding mower in the spring up till like dearth starts. I literally will just put my hand over my ear and I can fly my mower by um, within about 12 inches of the hive. Yeah. Once beginning of July hits, they don't like it anymore. And then if I miss it, then weed whacking and they're not they don't mind the mower so much but they don't like my weed whacker so i have to put my full suit on because yep. i swell up like a stuck pig every time i get stung and yeah. to weed whack around but i use shingles under um my lower highs i'm going to do it with the rest of them this year and the shingles are great because they don't disintegrate right. um they keep the weeds down it's just it's just you know so now if you're a backyard beekeeper and you've got a pretty yard and plantings and and right. you're going for a more aesthetically appealing look, you know, you may not want to do shingles, but. No, <laughs> well, you really cool. can't see them and you can turn them over where they're black. Like it, like I have some that are kind of have red in them. I have green and, you know, like flakes of light blue or whatever. And I mean, mine, you can't even tell that now. Um, so they, they don't last very long because the, you know, like Sue says, you're weed, weed, weed whacking, you know, behind them, on top of them, beside them. And then, you know, I mow and I put a, I, I put, um, when I weed eat, I put my leather gloves on and a, um, my jacket and because they do get pissy. Um, but when I mow, I just put a um, veil on because, you know, you go with the mower and you're gone before they, they come out and they're going, where's she at? Where's she at? You know, so yeah, but uh, you have to know you're in bees. Yeah. And the ones that come out after me really bad and won't, then they're no longer alive. <laughs> I changed, <laughs> I changed that <laughs> genetics real quick. So I don't, I won't have a mean bee, but, um, but to, you know, you can do all kinds of stuff. Now, if you're in a, an area that usually in the South, and is moist, um, you're probably going to have small hot beetles. And there's, it doesn't matter if you buy your your bees from a person that doesn't have them. Then by the end of summer, or if you keep them alive, the next summer you will have small hot beetles. They they fly in the air, they come in on stuff, and they just seem to find your hives and um, you know kill all the ones that you can. 
and just, you know, like if you crack your lid, they're usually on top. So be ready and just take your, don't do your, your hive tool because you'll miss them. Just take your finger and just crunch, 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 crunch them. You're, you're not going to get hurt because you've got a gloved finger. So just if, if you can kill all the ones that you can see, then your hive is better for it. And then there's all kinds of things that we can tell you how to, to get rid of them. And, and uh, I've seen, I've seen a video where um, they, they put a sheet out and they uh, had one person shaking and one person killing and they took their, their bees and shook them out on there. And then the small hive beetles, little black beetles fall out on the sheet and the person's killing them while the up bees are flying and going back. And so, I mean, if you get a lot, that would be the way to do it. If you could, you know, get help and one person killing and one person shaking and um, it, because they fly. So you have to be, you know, you have to be ready. So, but I would put a piece of cardboard down or a piece of wood or something and then shake the bees because you're not going to hurt, you know, not going to do them hard. You're just going to shake them off of the frames. And then you, you have the one that's shaking them has to look at the frames because they crawl in the cells. And so when they crawl, in and then crawl out, then you have to be ready to kill them. They're, they're a pest, but they can be managed. They're a lot better, easier than the mites that you're going to have to deal with. I have a friend, he runs between 20 and 30 highs and he has it, they live in town, but he has it on this retired farmer's property. And this guy had an old outbuilding go down with a poured like 40 by 50 concrete flat. So he has his hives all on that old concrete floor. Right. So it's level, it's clean, his electric goes around the outside of it. And uh, he let us use it. Um, the, our state inspector came and did a demonstration a couple of years ago here. And it made the cleanest, nicest looking bee yard mm -hmm. you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And the small but, hive beetles, they suffer for that because what a hot, small hive does they, they lay it and the larva crawls out the front and drops down into the dirt and they hatch and they crawl, they fly back up into there. So if you have cement like that, because rocks, they can still do it because as long as they can get down in that dirt and, you know, hibernate or whatever they do. And, uh, but cement that, I mean, if you're only going to have a couple hives, that's something to think about, but you can do the road mat and then you can do the gravel. A friend of mine had small hive beetles really bad over at Petersburg, and that's what he did. And then he got the the little, and this is up your your aisle, Sue. The the ne nematodes. Nematodes. Linda nematodes. Casey, Debbie, Linda Casey uses that all the time. You order these nematodes. You spring. You have to do it once a year, and you sprinkle them in the ground underneath your hive and they do something that they feed off the larva of the um, yes there you go yes of the small yes. hive beetle they they live off of that right. and i've heard no oh, they don't work and then i've heard others just praise them so i've used them before that i use them in gardening beneficial nematodes okay all mm -hmm. right yep so i hope that answered your question emily where do you live I live in Wayne County, West Virginia, but my hives are going to be located in Greenbrier County. Oh, okay. I'm well, in that's that's Kathy. Yeah. Okay, so we do have. I I finally found my club in Greenbrier. It's is that, um. Is that where you want to go? Is Greenbrier to the club or the the one close to your home? Where are I'm you at? I'm to find a club close to home and then right. get the experience to be able to run the bees up there. Right. Cool. Well, when you're where in Greenbrier. Uh, Neola. Okay. That's like north of White Sulphur. Right. I live uh, in Frankfurt. I'm uh, west of White Sulphur. I know where that is. Mm -hmm. Cool. She lives up on I a hill. Have one more question, and I feel like I'm wearing you guys out, but I do have one more question. You no. asked if I was going to be, you know, if you're going to have just a couple hives or if you're going to have a lot of hives. Are bees like chickens where you start out with a few and then you want more and more and more? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yep. It, it's not that you want more, it's that you get more. But there, there's ways around that too, because you can either split that and sell that nuke 
after your queen, your new queen gets bred and she's laying, don't sell it before you know that that queen is, is laying well, or you can split it out, take her out, the queen, she is her, and then go back in in seven days and we will, hopefully somebody will teach you this. If not, then we'll talk about it on the side. But you go back in a week later, like if you split on a Monday, then you go in that following Monday. So don't split unless you know that you can get back to it the, the following week at the same time. And then you kill every queen cell. So if you have 60 frames in there, you're going to look at 60 frames. So you're going to go frame by frame, shake the bees off, look all the way around it. And it sometimes they can be that big. What the hell? Right there. And and then if you miss it, then you're going to end up with a queen. So you want to look at 60 frames if you have 60 frames in there and one by one by one and then kill them all and put paper on top of them and then put that queen back on top and then that way you're back to where you were so there's ways around it you don't always have to grow and emily you could be like me hopefully not after hooking up with all these women where when i finally got honey for the first time somebody said oh my gosh are you selling your honey i said give me a minute i got 48 jars of honey this year um, you know, it's probably gonna be close to a hundred dollars a jar. They're like, what are you talking about? Like, well, that's what I got invested in it so far. <laughs> Emily, yeah, man. Emily, you're gonna find that you're you're gonna want more than two hives because you kind of work off of different hives for different problems or so four it's, four is good. I think four is good for a four. second year person. Yeah. Yeah, I have four, but I want to go to eight. I'm gonna start playing with different things this year anyway. You could go to ten. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah, I yeah. probably will. If Barb has what? Okay. Um, Emily, <laughs> I do know that um, there's a beekeeper association. It's called the Cabell Wayne County Beekeeper Association, and they meet in Huntington. Okay, there you go. I'll have to look them up. Okay. Um, I need to. Um, can I quit? Should I quit recording? We yeah. done? We basically yeah. done?